we want to welcome uh, every the participants, attendants that are joining us for this uh, for today's session. We are glad that you could make time on a Friday afternoon uh, to engage, discuss, and be part of uh, uh, today's session on um, uh, U.S. elections. Um, essentially, we are handling this uh, initiative, this project, this platform as a countdown to the U.S. elections 2020, uh, focusing on uh, implications for Africa. We launched this initiative, this platform, this debate uh, or virtual town hall last Friday, and we do have uh, the second uh, in the series. The series runs all the way to November 27th, so we are still in very early days. Even with, very, with the very dramatic developments of this week, uh, in terms of the announcement that uh, California Senator uh, Kamala Harris uh, will be running mate for the Democratic ticket, you know, running mate for Joe Biden. Uh, uh, quite interestingly, for those who might not uh, have been follow who might not have followed the news, was that the moment she was announced the running mate. Across the continent, there was appropriation of her. In some places, her name Kamala, being uh, you know African of some kind, being said, "No, look, she's our sister. She's my auntie. She's my granny, and so forth." <laughs> but that's that, that's that's part of the the drama and the interest in all this. Um, uh, throughout the sessions that are gonna come, we'll focus on various topical dimensions, topical issues, and themes be they related to trade and economics, be they related to the candidates themselves and the parties that represent the Republican, the Democratic Party, uh, be they the issues or the challenges that are associated with this particular edition of the US elections, uh, but all of those from an African perspective. Um, I, I don't think we need to go too much into the introduction of the center, but uh, suffice it to say, that the African Center for the Study of the U.S., uh, based at the University of the Witwatersrand, was established in uh, March 2018 to turn an analytical guess on the U.S. as a country, as a global power, as a society, and as a people. Uh, and we do this by enge through engagement such as this, you know, forums, now mostly virtual. We do this by through research and publication and through the teaching programs at uh, Wits University. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce panelists uh, for today's uh, discussion. Very glad to have with us very seasoned political uh, commentators. I almost said uh, political animals, because indeed they are political <laughs> animals. Well, we're that too. <laughs> <laughs> they are, uh, and, and this is uh, Francis Conge, who is a uh, Besides being a friend of the center, is a research associate with the Institute for Global Dialogue and is heavily published on matters Africa, US, uh, from uh, any perspective you want to think of, as long as it's uh, you know, political, international relations, and related matters. Uh, welcome, Francis. Uh, we will also, we also joined here uh, by you know, a regular commentator on uh, many matters, but also a friend of the center a retired American diplomat and associate editor of uh, the Daily Maverick newspaper, uh, Brooke Spector, uh, who is very well known in fact in political and cultural circles uh, in Johannesburg and parts of the US and indeed globally. So we are glad to have you uh, on this uh, discussion. Today we are going to focus on um, the 2020 elections uh, and we're just posing the question, are they going to be a constitutional and even perhaps political uh, problem. Are they, is there a crisis brewing as far as these elections are concerned? I think this is a, a topic that people have been uh, you know, discussing and considering and, and looking at. Uh, and, and we're going to do this by also uh, focusing on uh, the history of US elections. Uh, there have been past uh, controversies, even though from the African end, we usually think that things have always been very smooth in the U.S. There have been uh, bumps in the road in the past. Uh, and, and, and this is what the panelists are going to help us to understand, to debate, to discuss, uh, and, and, and to appreciate. 
Without further ado, I'll uh, invite now Mr. Brooks Spector, who will start us off uh, on this discussion. The floor is, is yours virtually, uh, Brooks. Okay, Bob, thank you very much. And good to be with you and with Francis and with those whose names I don't know and can't see yet, but who I assume are scattered around uh, Johannesburg and South Africa and perhaps even further. Uh, because of the events of this, this week, uh, I think it's probably useful to put a little bit of, a, a little focus on Kamala Harris, uh, who is in fact, as, as Bob said, now the uh, nominee uh, for vice, the vice presidency uh, together with Joe, Bom uh, Joe Biden uh, for the Democrats in this election. Um, because and uh, by virtue of her ancestorage, a father from Jamaica, a mother from South Asia in South India, in fact, uh, it's possible to argue that she represents a, the, 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 the new face of the United States, all in herself, increasingly diverse, increasingly multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-national, uh, if you will, uh, person, even as at the same time in her own life, by virtue of having decided at the age of 17, after years of schooling in primarily white institutions in California and for a while in Montreal, Canada, that she in fact wanted to make sure and make clear of her black identity by going to Howard University, which is uh, by most estimations, the premier historically black college or university in the United States. Uh, there's something called the Howard Swagger, that is you you go through that process, you come out, and you have a certain sense of poise and who you are that is almost, I'm going to use a terrible grammatical barbarism here, almost unique. Uh, some other places offer it. It used to be called the, the Harvard of Black America, and she chose that rather than to go to either of the universities her parents were associated with in California. Um, if it were the old vice presidency, it wouldn't matter so much. People, uh, candidates usually pick the vice presidential candidate to balance the ticket geographically uh, or sometimes ideologically within the party. Uh, but the vice president as a person really had very little to do uh, other than the three official constitutionally mandated responsibilities uh, to be the president of the Senate when it was in session, which is a boring, thankless job, and is usually handled by somebody else anyway, uh, to certify the electoral vote count at the end of a national presidential election, and not to put too fine a point on it, to get up every morning and inquire about the state of the president's health and his heart. Does it still beat? And then they could go off and do whatever they wanted. Um, the old version of that, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's first vice president, John Nance Garner, uh, re had described the vice presidency as not worth a bucket of warm, and you can fill in the word at that point, it starts with an S. Um, he was a fairly earthy Texan and he was given to that. The newspapers tidied it up and said, not worth a bucket of warm spit, but you know what it meant. Um, but the new version of the vice presidency, and most especially and most recently under Barack Obama, Joe Biden had enormous, a, a wide range of responsibilities and authority, but always at the behest of the president. In other words, there's no independent political nucleus. Uh, it's not like you have here in which um, Abe, uh, Ace, Ace Magashula and the president of the country can sometimes be seen to butt heads uh, or uh, disagree strongly or, as we're seeing now, disagree uh, surreptitiously, it appears. Um, to look at the U.S. electoral system, we think of it as a presidential election, uh, but since the federal government is not responsible for elections, they're actually run by each state separately. Uh, it's more like you, you have to win, you, you compete in 50 separate states. 
Uh, you win the election in a state and you get its full electoral weight, which is largely a reflection of population. So if you won California by two votes, you got all 55 of its electoral weight. And 55 California electoral votes, since there are only 535 electoral votes in total, um, it's a pretty hefty uh, pile of votes. In effect, you need 270 of those apportioned by population. You get that and you win, you're president. Uh, but remember too, that while you have that presidential election, one third of the Senate, the entire House of Representatives, and I once did a count of this and I came up with a number that it was something like 80,000 electoral offices in the country are up for grabs at any four year period. And they range from literally uh, county commissioners for uh, stray animals on up through uh, mayors and governors and uh, le state legislators. This year uh, is unique. Uh, it's unique in lots of ways, but it's unique because the electoral environment, the, the climate, the circumstances where a presidential election is taking place is being overwhelmed by a, by a collection of three superordinate issues. First, obviously, is the COVID pandemic, which at this point has, has killed 160 some odd thousand Americans and infected 5 million more. Uh, the resulting economic collapse, which not to put too fine a face on it, means 10% plus of the working population of the country is currently unemployed. Businesses by the thousands have been shut and states, even as they try to open, discover they have to close back down again. And then of course, not to ignore it, uh, the term I'm using now is the racialized turmoil that, that has flowed out of uh, the police killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement and the protest and demonstrations that have broken out in many cities and towns across the country. And all three of those, it's, it's like a giant malicious Venn diagram. They all overlap one to the other. And it's impossible to run for office now without taking into cognizance, not just one of those, but all three of them. Now, just as Bob had said, people tend, uh, Americans tend to, to some degree, and people in the world tend to think that uh, the U.S. electoral system is one of those eternals. Uh, get, it came down with the Ten Commandments, and it's been the way it is ever since it began. Um, but there have been a whole series of electoral uh, problems, chaos, confusion uh, over the years. And i just point to five of them quickly. When the Constitution was written, uh, there were, in fact, no political parties in the United States in any formal sense. And the assumption by the founders was that like um, Plato's idealized version of how a, po a political system should work, a body of elders, wise, experienced, gray beards, old men, a little bit like Francis, uh, they should, you, you did hear me, yes? Um, they they should they should be the ones to select the president. So the elections at the state level would pick these, these elders, these electors, and those people in turn would pick the president. Uh, it was not a direct correlation to, to voting. Um, as a result, through the express preferences of the people in those various states, in 1796, so we're talking 200 and what is it, 225 years ago, almost 25 years ago, um, just as the political party system began to emerge, um, John Adams was running uh, for president. He'd been the vice president and Thomas Jefferson had been secretary of state, but they represented two different political theories of how the country should be governed, very different. But the electoral college system pick them as president and vice president. And so they banged heads throughout a four year period about how the future of the country should run. In the year 1800, just four years later, in the next election, it still hadn't been worked out effectively and properly. And the president and vice president were still being picked separately by this electoral college. 
And as a result, um, Thomas Jefferson won the election as president, but Aaron Burr got the same number of electoral votes. He had been their vice presidential candidate, which meant that you had a man who was perpetually in office as vice president, who was steaming mad about the fact that the presidency had been stolen right out from underneath him. Now, a few years later, he went off and shot Alexander Hamilton in a, in a duel and then tried to set up an empire of his own in Mexico. So he probably was, was not, a, he was not going to be the perfect choice. By 1860, the country has been fleshed out to 30 some states and the predominant issue, the one that was tearing the country apart was the question of the extension of the, the uh, institution of slavery or its gradual abolition. In the event of the 1860 election, there were four major party candidates. There was Abraham Lincoln, as we, we all know, first, re first Republican party candidate who really had a chance to win an election. Uh, the Democratic Party, North and South, had split over whether they should uh, step back a bit from the question of slavery or in the South should uh, actively work to preserve it. And there was a fourth candidate, a man by the name of John Bell, whose basic argument representing an old fading party, the Whig Party, that uh, we should simply ignore the issue for another couple thousand years and, and just move on. The results were, of course, that Abraham Lincoln won in the North uh, decisively in almost all states. In the South, uh, John Breckinridge, who was the Southern Democrat, won. The country was split literally by the election into a civil war. Uh, that's about as that's about as nasty an outcome as you can expect. The election is held, and then there's a four and a half year civil war over over the results and the decision. In 1876, now we're only 15 years odd later. Um, the South has been defeated. It's being occupied by the forces of the Union, the, the, arm, the National Army, and the election is close. In fact, Samuel Tilden for the Democrats wins more votes, popular votes, than does Rutherford B. Hayes. But there are disputed counts in three different states and finally a commission is appointed that appears nowhere in the constitution or in law actually uh, a commission to determine which of the uh, competing vote tabulations should be counted and they cut basically a backroom deal that in exchange for letting the republican hayes win the election he would authorize the removal of union troops from the south thereby rolling back the res effectively the political results of the Civil War and allowing Southern uh, segregationists to regain control of their 11 Southern states. Uh, if you were a white Southerner who dreamt of the Confederacy, that was a victory. If you were anybody else, that was clearly something of a defeat. But now you think for 100 years or more, everything is working effectively, the system holds together. In the year 2000, which is what, uh, 20 years ago, um, the whole result depends on the state of Florida. Now, Florida is a big state, large electoral count. And there have been several recounts at this point, ranging from the Democrats have won by 538 odd votes to the Republicans having won by about 1,500 votes. When you have 6 million people voting in an election, that's much less than the statistical margin of error for just counting out the ballots. And so you had those bizarre photographs of people staring at these old style Holerith cards where the boat would have been punched through, trying to figure out if a little piece of paper had been pulled out or not, or just pushed in a bit or hanging by a thread. And as it turned out, it went all the way to Supreme Court, which then ruled in another one of these astonishing moments, five to four, that George W. Bush had won the election in Florida, even though the recount had not yet the, I think it was the fifth version of the recount, had yet to be entirely completed. Uh, Al Gore graciously conceded. It leaves you with the question of whether or not there would have been an Iraq war number two if Al Gore had won the presidency. So we leave that dangling there. Where are we now? Um, 
we're two months and a bit away from an actual election and the desperation that you see on the the acts and the i guess the face of donald trump to hang on grimly and finally push across the finish line is the motivating wheel i think we should argue uh, for his increasingly harsh angry racialized appeal to his core base that's part a part b is as a fairly well organized effort to suppress as best possible the extent to which people can easily vote in states that are presumed to be democratic leaning and astonishingly to lessen the ability of the postal system to, to receive and forward in a timeliest manner, excuse me, mail-in ballots in order to finish the election. Um, this is setting up what I tend to refer to as the lawyer's permanent employment measure because there will be lawsuits over this like we have never seen and the Supreme Court will almost inevitably, if the race is close, be drawn into this yet again. By contrast, I think it's fair to argue now on the basis of Joe Biden's pick of Kamala Harris uh, as his running mate, that they're trying to bring both a set of new ideas borrowed from the left side of the Democratic Party together with what amounts to a pledge to the country of, a, of civility, empathy with the average citizen, normality in government, rather than this horrific moment where you have to check to see what the president has done overnight just to make sure it doesn't terrify you further, and a sense of calmness that things will be better, things will be more rational and easier as we go forward. I think I'll leave that as our last point, I Bob, that probably is just about 15 minutes. Sure. Thanks, uh, Brooks. You've um, uh, covered uh, the 15 minutes pretty well. And, the, and I think we want to thank you for packing into those 15 minutes uh, everything from a uh, you know, historical uh, perspective to present, uh, which is quite a job. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting tale. We should have... Um, a couple of questions for you on the basis of that, comments, things that we need clarified. But for now, I think let's turn it over to Francis Konege uh, and, and uh, hear his perspectives on this. I think unmute and uh, let's hear you out. I think you'll have to unmute. I hope you read my lips now that you can't hear me. Unmute. Please don't make me do Francis's presentation. I hope he's able to look at the screen as well. And unmute. I think we'll ask Shirin to help oh. unmute her. All right, sure. There you go. A am, yeah. am I? Okay. All right. All okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Bob. And uh, uh, for, first, first, let me make a, a very brief comment about. Um, uh, by Kamala Harris as uh, the vice presidential nominee, I, I think one of the, I think one thing that is very significant about the Biden uh, Harris ticket is that it it represents, uh, apart from from trying to bring together ideological unity. Uh, within the party, it, it it represents a very significant uh, generational intergenerational transition. Uh, because what what you're what you're looking at is the uh, is the last of a of what uh, has been a very long generation of um, establishment figures in both the. Uh, uh, the Democratic and Republican parties, when they when they were less polarized, uh, 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 Biden uh, get into his late seventies uh, is basically yesterday's man. Uh, Kamala Harris uh, 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 is something of a follow up of the new generation of. Uh, Political leadership that is coming on the scene, 
and so uh, particularly if uh, uh, Biden and Harris win the election, uh, she she represents the the beginning of a, a totally new generation uh, in in American politics. Uh, and to some extent, you can even you can even see that on the Republican side, uh, since one of the uh, the only the only real uh, female uh, prospect that they have is is uh, another uh, politician of Indian descent, Nikki Haley. <laughs> uh, so you could have a you in 2024 you could potentially have a a Harris Haley um, contest for the presidency. Anyway, uh, I want to. I, I, I want to present my uh, follow-up to Brooks in two parts. Um, first, addressing the constitutional and political uh, crisis issues uh, relating to the election uh, in November. Secondly, uh, commenting on Africa policy and picking up where uh, uh, Gilbert Kadiagala left off last Friday, in which I basically agree with him about the election outcome uh, not guaranteeing major implications in what uh, has largely unfolded as a bipartisan Africa policy. Uh, that's not to say that there couldn't be major Africa policy development, just that it is unlikely unless a more visionary and in my view uh, 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 pan-African perspective emerges. But I am not going to limit my remarks just to Africa, but consider implications more broadly for foreign policy generally, since this impinges on resources for domestic priorities at home. But as to the prospect of the election uh, resulting in a constitutional and or political crisis, to follow up uh, from Brooks's very informative uh, lead in to this discussion, uh, in my estimation, the US under Donald Trump's presidency has been in an unprecedented political, if not constitutional crisis uh, ever, ever since his uh, term started in 2017. It could well deepen in November, but I would venture that Trump and his administration have, if anything, exposed major weaknesses in the American constitution and uh, inadequacies of what has to be viewed historically and up to the present uh, as a very qualified democracy. Indeed, democracy itself is far from a fail-safe uh, safeguard against tyranny. Democracies have been known to, to elect dictators and authoritarian rulers. The illiberal democracies in Hungary, Poland, Israel are cases in point, as is our own under uh, the Trump administration, which has been a clear and present danger to uh, democracy in America. As a backlash against the promise and potential of President uh, Barack Obama, Trump represents the prospect of American democracy being transformed into uh, what one could call a tyranny of the minority authoritarian regime enabled by the Republican Party's structural advantage in the Electoral College at the expense of the popular vote. Further, the, uh, uh, the Republican Party has evolved into such a narrowly based ideologically far-right extremist movement waging culture wars, it can no longer win both the popular as well as electoral vote. Republicans cannot be considered a governing party, but essentially an opposition uh, white grievance party. One can predict uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will win the popular vote by substantial margin. The question is whether they will win the Electoral College. And here we have about as perfect a storm as any with the coronavirus, which could very well undermine voter turnout uh, for Biden, Harris, and the Democrats, while Trump openly opposes and is doing everything he can to sabotage mail-in voting, which for most Americans is the safest way uh, to vote during this pandemic. These are the circumstances that could result in a disputed election, 
given Trump's indication he may not accept the outcome if he loses. This could produce the constitutional crisis and throw the political system into a tailspin. The U.S. politics uh, currently, U.S. politics currently reflects, I would say, a civil war pattern, exposing how the, the American civil war that ended slavery has never uh, been definitively settled, uh, particularly uh, uh, in terms of the, the fateful election of 1876, which uh, Brooks talked about. Thus, the U.S. electoral and political system is long overdue for major reform as a means of depolarizing the political landscape by rebalancing the power equation between Democrats and Republican parties and their respective voting constituencies while securing expanded access to voting, which Republicans seek to restrict. Were Biden to win the election and Democrats the Senate as well as the House, priority could be given to convening a constitutional review commission to exhaustively examine and recommend reforms to the electoral system and or a constitutional convention accompanied by uh, passing a new voting rights act and statehood for the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico as President Obama advocated in his John Lewis eulogy. The thing is at present, the Electoral College combined with the structure of the electorate reflects a balance favoring Republicans and some of the most extreme reactionary uh, constituencies in the electorate. The term conservative does not do justice to defining the far right extremism of Trump and his allies. Unless a Biden administration and Democratic Congress move quickly at the outset on electoral re reform, and statehood for both Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico, any gains made by Democrats can be reversed as happened with Obama. The fact that the U.S. demographically is becoming more and more diverse, less and less white, means little while small towns and rural areas are overrepresented compared to major cities and metropolitan regions, especially in the Senate where all states get two senators no matter the state's population. Therefore, we need one or two more states to redress this structural imbalance favoring Republicans in the Senate. Because of the devastating impact of the coronavirus, electoral reform will obviously have to, to accompany a major New Deal type economic recovery, which leads us into reflecting on foreign policy, including implications for Africa. Um, uh, Biden will have to come to terms with defense spending and the absurdly overblown Pentagon budget. Canceling Trump's tax cuts for the rich will not uh, be enough uh, to free up the magnitude of a recovery budget required to overcome the economic and social impact of the pandemic. This basically requires a rethought out foreign policy and national security strategy emphasizing international cooperation and multilateralism for advancing world peace for climate change defense, including defense against pandemics. One thing Trump has done is to shatter the outdated post-war, post-Cold War and war on terrorism frameworks without however, re replacing it with any alternative, given his purely transactional approach, uh, with the exception of the most pro-Israel bias shown by any previous administration, Democratic or Republican. Otherwise, a new framework will have to shift from the transatlantic northern hemisphere to a more global south strategic emphasis where Africa becomes more and more central as the, the future unfolds. Within this context, Africa policy will have to reflect more geostrategic and geoeconomic imagination, which should really not be that difficult if two things are focused on. First, the AU and African governments will have to become 
proactive in exercising agency in dictating priorities for external powers geared uh, to the AU's Agenda 2063, emphasizing regional and continental integration in accelerating momentum of the, Africa uh, the African uh, continental free trade area. No bilateral deals like uh, that now being considered between the U.S. and Kenya. Second, the U.S. should de-emphasize embassies in every single African country in favor of prioritizing relations with the AU's regional economic communities by establishing regional economic community U.S. forums linked to the uh, U.S. Ambassador to the AU in Addis. So for example, let's take AGOA, the African uh, Growth and Opportunity Act, could be geared toward an eventual U.S.-Africa continental free trade area deal, perhaps by regionalizing AGOA within the framework of regional economic community U.S. forums. While on the governance side, the U.S. Uh, could uh, work with the AU and regional economic communities in regionalizing the African peer review mechanism as a lever leveraging instrument driving integration and governance in individual countries. Finally, the U.S. needs to end its Middle East and North Africa designation, MENA, in favor of recognizing the Maghreb as an integral part of Africa, not the Middle East, within the context of pushing for ending the stalemate in Western Sahara and working with the AU as well as the EU in ending uh, the civil war in Libya, which in turn ought to feed into a broader Mediterranean stabilization strategy, starting with reviewing policies towards Egypt and Israel. Why, for example, should Israel continue receiving generous military support from the U.S. now that Arab states are beginning to normalize relations with Israel at the expense of the Palestinians? Similarly, why should Egypt? The bottom line is that foreign policy and national security strategy will have to be substantially revised to accommodate the domestic uh, restrengthening of an American Republic decimated by Republicans uh, going back to Ronald Reagan. Now, that, that presumes that, uh, that Biden and Harris uh, will come out winning in, in November. Uh, but even there, there's going to be a lot of debate um, particularly on the foreign policy side, Biden has, has tended to move uh, further to the left in domestic policy. Uh, when it comes around the foreign policy, we don't know. We're not, sure. we're, we're not sure where that's going to go, though it would seem that we, can, we, we, we really cannot go back to uh, uh, pre-Trump uh, uh, normal. If Trump wins, then we're looking at a, um, an extended period of inst political instability in, in the U.S., um, possibly even uh, uh, a, a, a resumption of impeachment, um, particularly if, the, if, 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 for example, let's, let's, let's take it that Trump hypothetically does win re-election. But what happens, and this would be interesting, what happens if uh, the Democrats lose the presidency but gain the Senate? So then you have, uh, you have, you have Trump facing a Democratic-controlled Congress in both the House and the Senate. So there, <laughs> there are any number of scenarios that uh, we, we could um, uh, think uh, think of that um, uh, that that might play out. Now, 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 Brooks has, in fact, has has raised the prospect that uh, that a disputed election could actually end up uh, 
at least in the interim, in Nancy Pelosi being being president. Now, now that would that that, that would be an interesting, uh, entertaining prospect that 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 one could uh, contemplate as well. So you know, the 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 thing is, is that I think that, however it turns out, the the prospect for a a crisis. Uh, in November is is quite high, and um, uh, but if we you know we if if it comes out the way many of us want it, we 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 could be looking at a a, a Biden Harris administration, and then a number of the issues that uh, that I've tried to go through, uh, you know, uh, will will be joined. But I'll I'll stop there. Thanks, uh, thanks, Francis. And um, I, equally, I think we've the, 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 you, you are you know talking knots and points uh, quite uh, spot on uh, in in various respects. Uh, and uh, we do note that you are ending off on that note of uncertainty uh, that uh, we are not too certain what happens in, uh, in in November. And 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 I think this is the point at which I'll turn it over back to Brooks to kind of, um, it, you know, just weigh in Brooks on this whole point of uncertainties uh, at the November uh, elections. Why are we, in fact, uh, for those of us who are lay, why are we even talking about uh, uncertainties and even the potential for chaos and, and of which, which nature of chaos are, in, are we, in fact, looking at? Is it a situation that could turn out like it's some African countries where after elections you actually have post-election violence in some countries like Nigeria in the 60s, actually civil war. Are we looking at those kinds of prospects? Thank you, Bob. As, as, as you heard in my presentation, there was, of course, one occurrence in which there was mm -hmm. effectively a civil war in which half a million people died, which, and which took five years to conclude, and which ended a an institution which was noxious and and un, and horrific, uh, even if it didn't cure all the ails that came from that. Um, but one of the things we need to consider when we talk about this is that unlike many countries that have parliamentary systems, even the United States operates on a fixed term basis. In other words, you don't have a you don't have a president as the head of a party and then the head of the, of the party in its parliament, the Congress, uh, and you don't then have votes of no confidence and then snap elections. You have fixed terms and you have an election every four years for the presidency regardless of circumstance. As a result, um, come January 20th, 2021, a, pre a new president will be sworn in or a, new, a president for a new term will be sworn in, whether 49.9% of the country likes the outcome or not is in, in a technical sense irrelevant. Because if the man, in this case, who wins the election by winning 270 of those electoral votes out of the 538, uh, if he wins that total, he is the president, even if it means that the guy who is sitting in the White House now has to be escorted gently by the National Capitol Park Police to please go home permanently. Um, that, will, that will be the net effect. Whether the population as a whole likes the outcome, whether there will be brawls in the street, and whether we'll have you know, American versions of stick fighting over this or the occasional rifle shot, um, that's a great film script, but it it's, it hasn't happened in the living memory of anybody in the United States now. Uh, so on the one hand, I guarantee you it's going to be a hotly contested and unpleasantly accepted result, regardless of who wins. On the other hand, um, the horror tale of an election in which you have uh, the 1920 uh, German version of Spartacists and Freikor, uh, uh, this, uh, demobilized soldiers fighting it out for control, or in, in your case, the, uh, the Nigerian battles over who actually won and how badly they cheated to get there. Uh, 
that's unlikely. But what you will have is a fractured polity, a fractured political world, because of, in large part, the corrosive effect of four years of Donald Trump in the White House. Uh, and let's be fair too, the, uh, the largely unpleasant effect of the way in which media, in this case I'm talking about ultra-partisan or hyper-partisan media and social media, have used the political system to push hard on very small but um, enormously fractious uh, positions. I mean, you see it already. There is a um, uh, there's a, something of a campaign to try to explain that Kamala Harris isn't really an American citizen because both of her parents were foreigners and it isn't clear what their visa status was on the day she was born, even though the Constitution for the 14th Amendment legislation and at least one Supreme Court decision back in 1898 make it very clear that if you're born in the country, regardless of circumstance, even if your parents were illegal immigrants the day before you're born and you just happen to slip over the border that night and get, and you, you, you are lucky to be born the next morning, you're still a citizen by birth. Um, and this, is, this has been, uh, this has been, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? This, this has been uh, conclusively uh, determined in law, in constitutional theory, and in, con and in court decisions. Whether or not people will continue the whispering campaign or the disputes about it, I mean, it, the human heart's a little harder to judge. But by the same token, I don't see street battles. I don't see long months, years litigation in the courts. What I do see is a lot of very sharp elbows over the results in some of the states that are close because there will be so many mail-in ballots and because there'll be so much disputing as to whether or not this ballot or that ballot is a legitimate ballot. There will be disputes about whether or not the ballot system uh, was counted properly. Uh, there will be disputes about whether or not ballots that arrived at the uh, into the system the day after the election, but are postmarked before the election, whether those must be or should be or can be counted. We'll have a, a whole plethora of these, of these kinds of disputes and cases. The best thing you can hope for is that, uh, in terms of the stability of the system, is that one or the other candidate wins conclusively and there is little dis dispute about who won. There is dispute, obviously, about what that victory means and what it, what it means for the country and the world, but there's no disputing who won. That's the, in a way, that's the best case. The worst case is that there are commissions and there are court cases and there are lawyers by the, by the shipload fighting every one of these battles state by state by state for the next number of years. Um, but eventually, the whistle blows. January 20th, the whistle blows. And the game is over and the teams drag off their wounded comrades and uh, something happens. Sure. And if, as Francis alluded to, if there is still no resolution, uh, then Nancy Pelosi, the 80-year-old Demo longtime Democratic Speaker of the House now, um, she gets sworn in as acting president, uh, acting right acting for how long, no one's quite sure because they never had that circumstance before. And I can't find case law or, or law or, or, or court cases that even talk to that question. So that will be a, that will be a fun fight all on its own, just how long right. she stays acting. No, sure, I, I think, think that, that would be very interesting. Uh, that, that, that's interesting. I can think I we'll come back. Say, okay. Brooks, you have something to add? I'm sorry. Bob, can I just add one other thing? Yeah, I want to okay. just add one thing to what Francis said about U.S. policy to Africa. I don't want to get into a whole thing about all of his points, but he should keep in mind, I'm sure he knows this, that the reason why there are U.S. embassies in even the smallest countries in Africa, whether it's <laughs> Equatorial Guinea or Fernando uh, or <laughs> Sao, Sao Tome and Principe, is that there was a pledge in 1961 that every independent African country 
would get an embassy and an ambassador so that their voice would be heard in Washington, even if it was, as I say, like Saint, uh, Saint Tome, uh, Sao Tome and Principe with, you know, with a handful of citizens. Uh, now, you can argue that that policy uh, skews things in, a, in strange ways, but no African country on the continent would accept the idea that the U.S. would pull an embassy out to be replaced by regional officers operating out of Addis Ababa or uh, somewhere else for any function whatsoever. Okay, let, 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 let me just come back on that. No, I, realistically, I can't see uh, the U.S. pulling out, uh, pulling embassies out of every African country. Uh, but I do think that um, uh, th th there there could be a mix of uh, of upgrading representation and status of regional economic communities, along with a series of very strategic uh, uh, countries. So. Uh, so the, so there would be there, I mean there, there would be definitely uh, continued embassies in a number of countries, but whether or not we need to have an embassy in every African country, uh, I th I think this is something that needs to be uh, re re reviewed and, and debated because I think that uh, 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 I think that the 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 urgency of uh, regional and co continental integration is, uh, it, it, it is, is so great as we move along that the fragmentation of the continent and how that fragment, fragments policy towards Africa is, in my view, unsustainable. I mean, it, particularly in terms of trying to come up with a, a coherent framework of, of, of US-African relations. And uh, uh, there has not been there has not been enough emphasis on uh, on, on the integration uh, priority in terms of uh, dealing with Africa. Now, the African continental free trade area, uh, fortunately, does begin to um, uh, give greater uh, a, a greater sense of um, Need for in integration, but I, I just don't think, and I and and this is where I think that Gilbert last week was was um, uh, you know was very refreshing in the way he kind of poo pooed implications uh, as though there was going to be a major implication one way or the other in terms of Africa policy. The thing is, is that Africa policy basically is stagnant. I mean, you've you've got a lot of Good programs. I mean, uh, but you don't have you don't have uh, uh, a compelling overall strategy. And I and I think one of the unfortunate one of the disappointments of the Obama administration in terms of Africa, for example, with his um, you know uh, ancestry in Kenya, he did not come. He could have, but he did not come up with a compelling. Um, uh, approach to East Africa. Uh, so, I mean, I think this is, I, I agree with you in terms of, uh, uh, yeah. you know, the, how problematic it could be in terms of uh, pulling embassies out. I'm not advocating that it, all, all embassies, but I think this is something that really needs to be debated. Francis, yeah, thanks. I think I was actually going to, uh, you know, jump in to say, this, all these points that are being raised are very important, valid, and in, in, in many respects, uh, particularly the whole question of uh, U.S. policy towards Africa, uh, and, and in fact, African policy towards uh, the U.S., as discussed, in fact, by Gilbert and John Stremlow last weekend. But I would like us to really focus a little more on the elections themselves for now. We'll have yeah. plenty of time to discuss, right. you know, policy okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, more broadly in the coming mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and the question I wanted to put to Francis, which you can perhaps try and uh, respond to fairly fast, uh, is, um, you know, the description of uh, the Armageddon uh, or chaotic 
situation uh, in the U.S. as we go towards these elections, um, uh, you know, is it, it, interesting from an African perspective uh, to the extent that Africans have always looked to, to the U.S. as a model of electioneering uh, and, and, and politics more broadly uh, and, and so forth, notwithstanding developments such as uh, the 2000 elections, um, which mm -hmm. uh, I think Brooks and uh, yourself mentioned, where Al Gore um, is assumed, you know, you know, something actually won, right? but, but then it was uh, decided the other way. So what does, it, what does that do then to African countries that look to the US as a role model of democracy? Uh, and, 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 and in addition to that, a related question, what then happens to this notion or question or approach of U.S. democracy promotion initiatives on the continent uh, through USAID and other means? Uh, Francis, uh, in a couple of minutes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it, uh, it, it, it brings about a much more realistic uh, uh, discussion about uh, democracy o overall. Uh, uh, because, you know, you know I, th I think the problem is that a lot of us have not re really uh, looked at the history of democracy in the United States. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think the presentation that Brooks made on, on um, the various hiccups that have come about over, the, uh, over decades and years is very instructive of the fact that... Um, Realistically, the U.S. is not a, a and has not been a paragon of democracy. So, I think that the U.S. will have to come up with a much more realistic approach uh, uh, to democracy and democracy uh, promotion. Um, you know, and 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 it it uh, sets the stage for what could be a you know a real uh, healthy dialogue rather than the U.S. You know, uh, uh, prescribing. Uh, there's there's more of a need for for a dialogue. But at the other, on the other end, it 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 has to be up to Africa to be proactive and to exercise agency in determining the terms of these, um, you know, these conversations with the U.S on how uh, the U.S. and Africa should engage. Uh, uh, but, but clearly, but to, let, let's say, for example, uh, however the election uh, turns out in November, you could very well have, uh, just as you've had uh, ongoing uh, demonstrations uh, since uh, you know, the death of George, George Floyd, I mean, I could foresee. I, I, I don't. Uh, I agree with Brooks on the fact that you would not uh, be likely to have, you know, a a magnitude of of civil civil war level violence. But you could have a, a if if Trump wins, uh, or however the election turns out, you could have uh, a a magnitude of mass demonstrations. Uh, uh, that would um, be ongoing for quite some time. Because the thing is, is that people in the U.S. are getting tired of uh, the kind of uh, representational system uh, or misrepresentational system that we have. So you see, as this plays out, this in itself will, will uh, convey the, you know, what, what it is about democracy that that the U.S. either represents or ceases to represent. So this is right. going to be an ongoing uh, uh, situation. Right. I think I, I, an interesting perspective, and I'll uh, also ask uh, Brooks to just weigh in on, I think, I know Brooks, you might want to weigh in on another matter, but I just am very keen for you to, you know, comment uh, or respond or to, you know, discuss that whole question of, um, uh, you know, I think France is saying essentially that uh, the U.S. itself needs reforms uh, from in, in democracy, and this has been the case for a long time. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, the conundrum is that Africans look to the U.S. Uh, obviously, France is saying Africans need to rethink that as well. What's your What's your perspective on all this? 
Well, I mean, I think first of all, uh, the, the events of the last four years or the circumstances of the last four years uh, have been a, a welcome dose of, uh, or maybe an unwelcome dose of, of cold water on, uh, for a lot of people about the, the effectively the sanctity of the American democratic experience as, as an example without peer, without, uh, without competitors. Um, and it's forced, I, I, I read lots of columnists and lots of opinion writers from everywhere from people off, to, you know, way off into the stranger recesses of the left to, uh, if I can hold my nose long enough to the <laughs> deeper recesses of the, of the right. Um, and pretty much everybody has reached a conclusion that the current system and the stresses and strains on it have become more than the system can easily accommodate at this point, and that there needs to be some kind of change and reform. The real question, of course, is always what kind of change and what kind of reform, and that's where the conversation breaks down into a thousand pieces because very few people agree precisely on what is what is necessary or appropriate or useful or even harmful. But the conversation in the US has become in some ways both much angrier as well as more realistic about the nature of the system. Vis-a-vis -vis the conversation to Africa or with Africa it's also made that conversation more interesting and more realistic because there are examples you can point to in African societies and in American societies where the, the obvious lack of democratic practice or theory uh, is available for pretty much anybody to see. Having said all that, however, the, the American democratic experience, if you go back to its beginnings, about a quarter of the white population, generously speaking, was allowed to vote and participate in civic matters because you had largely to be a white, free, uh, not in jail, property owner and male, uh, which narrows the field down rather a lot. That's over the next 200 and some odd years, that's changed. That's the formal system. The informal system, of course, has all kinds of other issues. Um, but I, I, I think that if I were a practicing diplomat now, although I would find it very hard to explain, let alone defend much of what's passed for policy in the Trump administration, I would also find that it would be a much more interesting discussion about the nature of democratic theory and practice in the US and in the countries or country where I was working or representing. Uh, let me just add one, one word to Francis's earlier comments. Y you may want to expand that multilateral approach, but keep in mind there are already many government, US uh, diplomatic representatives to all of the, in, all of the regional or uh, multilateral functions in Africa. There is uh, an ambassador and a full staff to the AU. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if the East African Economic Community and its successor now, the All Africa, what, 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 uh, were to actually exist as an, as an entity with real policies, real budgets, and real impacts, there would undoubtedly be an ambassador and a full staff appointed there as well, just as there is an ambassador to the European Union, to the OECD, to NATO, to uh, a number of other European institutions that overlap each other in geographical extent, uh, because that's the nature of these things. The, the policy, in effect, gets integrated in Washington or ignored depending on who's in charge and what they're doing. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. And as a result, um, I, I think you're, you're creating a sort of an ideal universe of what you would like to see, but it's incumbent on Africa and African nations to get its house organized too. Footnote, just well, yeah. keep this one, yeah. just keep this okay. one statistic in mind. Mm -hmm. um, 
it takes seven years on average for a trade agreement, a bilateral uh, trade agreement with the United States to get actually negotiated and, and agreed to by the parties. Uh, the Southern African Customs Union US trade agreement foundered, never happened. The countries in Southern Africa couldn't devote enough staff time and couldn't agree among themselves what constituted the right concepts to be pushed. If you can imagine 50 some odd nations, each with different views, all trying to convince the United States to follow their idea on an all Africa free trade association, US trade compact. How old are you and how long do you want to wait? All right, no, good. Well, can, I think, can, can I I think just, let me jump in. Yeah, let me okay. jump in here. Yeah. And again, uh, sorry, Francis, let me jump in again sure. here and uh, try and guide us back to, I know, I, and as I said earlier, I know how important these policy uh, issues are, and uh, definitely we'll have a session where we come on to them uh, in a more explicit sense. Yeah, but, we I don't, don't. Us, but I wanted us to, to, to take us back to uh, I wanted to take us back to yeah. a little the more sharper uh, almost immediate questions and mm. I wanted to pose the question of why are we even discussing the possibility of a Trump win in November uh, given the factors that you have uh, adduced uh, you know quite efficiently earlier the pandemic handling the economy issues of race and so forth. And, and I know obviously issues of allegiances and uh, you know, the, the, the bases as they call might feature there and so forth. But you know, for an African audience like us, you know, uh, you know observing the situation from uh, Lusaka, Zambia or something, mm -hmm. you'd be like, there should, there should be no discussion. Why are we even discussing anything? So Francis well, first, then Brooks on that point. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, you know, the. The problem, Bob, and the, and the thing is, is that, I mean, the last thing that we want to see is a Trump win, but I hope we haven't lost Francis. Uh, because we're going to something big, I think. He looks frozen. I'm not sure whether or not his link is live. Uh, and we'll give him, a, I think we'll ask participants to be just patient for a, a min, not under a minute, in fact, less than a minute. We see we, he is coming on. If not, then, um, uh, because I thought I saw him actually launch into a very major point, and then just at that right point with the time, I, you know, we lost it. Should I go ahead, Bob, and then, then you can break me I off think we should. I, I, in fact, it's disappeared. So let's, let, let's go with uh, your perspective, yeah. Okay. Why are we even talking about a Trump win? All right, if, if the United States were Australia, where it's a re civic requirement to vote, Donald Trump would never have been president for a very simple reason. Um, on, on, in general, only about somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 to 58% of the registered to vote population votes in a presidential election. What this means when you convert it through is that Donald Trump in, in 2016 won with somewhere around 24% of the registered voters voting for him. That meant there was a huge collection of people who chose not to vote. And theoretically, at least, they could have voted him by a huge margin, or they could have voted against him by an, equal, an almost equally huge margin the other way or in theory at least, they could have picked a third or a fourth party even, but they, cho they chose not to. Now there are all kinds of theories as to why people don't vote. Uh, one of them is that they're, they're sufficiently disinterested in the whole process that they don't care. A second reason is, is often stated as they believe the whole system is such, such a, a, a fixed racket that their little participation doesn't matter, doesn't count, won't change anything, it's all rigged anyway. It's all been decided somewhere in some mythic committee room. Uh, and the, the third reason uh, that's often stated is the complexities that are thrown in the way of voting in various jurisdictions in the United States. For example, 
if you're registered to vote, you go to your polling place, you show up and you show proof of who you are, a passport, a driver's license, uh, something like that. We don't have a national identification system in the United States, so there's no ID card that says, hi, I'm an American, and my name is John Smith, and here's my number, and so forth. A social security number does not count as, a, as an ID. Driver's license is yes, no, but not everybody has a driver's license. But anyway, you show up and you sign your, the register that you are in fact here and you're ready to vote, ready to roll. And then the, it's the, uh, the, uh, the person behind that desk, if they are particularly partisan and they don't like the cut of your suit or disagree with you, or they know you even worse, and they decide they don't like what you're going to do, they look at your signature and they look at the one in the register book and they go, I'm not sure that's you. And your vote can be put over in a basket marked provisional or being held over until further verification or something like that. There is no national registration system for elections. And so therefore it is, it is gameable in some degree by partisan individuals, even though the system is designed to be nonpartisan. And so that's a third variation on it. And I think the fourth variation is something that we have no control over, and that's called weather. Um, people wake up, they look outside, and it's pouring rain all day. And they, they, they get permission to take off of work. But the thought of standing in a line of voters waiting to vote in an hour and a half of soaking cold rain in the middle of November, uh, that's not a really happy idea for lots of people. And so that whole concept uh, of voting falls away. That's one of the reasons why mail-in votes, in fact, are being pushed so hard. It will deter, sorry, it will not deter people from voting by virtue of uh, climate or, or, uh, or weather reasons. It will make it easier for people to vote because you sign it, you cast your ballot, put it in a sealed envelope, countersign it, throw it in the mailbox or deposit it at the place where these things go and the system is taken care of and you don't have to wait for two hours. And that fact of making it possible for people to vote by mail is what terrorizes people like Donald Trump that they will all show up and vote Democratic. Now there's no evidence actually that they will. And there's been the, the, stu the, the limited studies that have happened on mail-in voter, voter behavior, uh, do not point to overwhelming Democratic voters. Uh, in fact, what it tends to show is that people who, who vote by mail-in ballots look remarkably like, um, in their voting behavior, like the people who show up and stand in line for two hours. It will also uh, make it eat much easier for people, you know, the elderly. If you're a 75 year old person and you walk with a Zimmer frame or a cane, the idea of standing there in the icy cold, cold rain, that's pretty daunting stuff, especially with the COVID pandemic virus problem that is about. So all of that makes it hard to guess have to game it all out, but the Republicans think they're on to something. And so therefore, voter suppression, the term we used earlier, making it more difficult to sign, to show up and get your, uh, your ballot, or, or uh, making you... In 1890, if you were an American citizen in North Carolina, you showed up to vote and you'd actually registered you, Bob. Uh, they'd look at you and they'd say, Mr. Bob, Read that part of the, of the North Carolina State Constitution, chapter 42-7, which talks about county and municipal bonds, and explain it. Now, there aren't 10 people in North Carolina who could explain that, that paragraph to the satisfaction of anybody, and you probably can't either, unless you wrote it. And so now you're disqualified as an, as an unqualified voter. So voter suppression is a real thing. Closing voting stations is a real thing. Uh, and all of that is a function of the fact that voting remains, has always been, a state function as opposed to a national function. I think countries, I mean, there are some countries who, some people who have half jokingly said, this would be a really good year for, for an African observer mission to show up in the United States to watch the balloting to make sure it's fair. 
Right, right. No, I, I think that, which could be a lot of fun. That would be a lot of uh, fun and as a reversal, uh, you know, seeing uh, mm-hmm. African observer missions all the way yeah, in the yeah. various uh, American states. I think uh, it's an idea that we should suggest to the African Union to. Oh, I think so. <laughs> I, I, to, it's a little the, late, to begin, but I, I think it should. I think it certainly should be because. Uh, over the years, uh, the American government often, and other people, have often sponsored visiting groups from foreign countries, Africa, Latin America, Asia, to come watch the process because it was a, it, it's a wonderful event. It's, you know, great civic right, moment. Right, right. Uh, right. but, uh, but I wanted be, to move. Yeah, certainly. I, wanted, uh, I think since we've lost Francis, we'll just, uh, we're just the two of us, but we'll... Uh, try to move towards the, the end. Uh, there's, a, there's a colleague who has asked a question, but I suppose this question has been answered in various guises. I think he, want, he or she wanted to know how the idea of uh, you, uh, you know, enhanced US diplomatic representation at uh, regional economic community level will work. But I think, in fact, it is you, Brooks, who did mention that uh, it, as a matter of fact, uh, American ambassadors represent um, regional economic communities and there's a full ambassador at the AU. In fact, I know for a fact that the uh, US ambassador to Tanzania, for example, is also the East African community uh, representative. And I suppose the ambassador in uh, Lusaka, Zambia, will also be representative for Comesa and so forth and so on. So I think that is pretty covered. The question, however, that... Um, would be of interest, and I think just following up on the earlier question, is uh, I, I now understand, and I'm sure our audience understand, that whole issue of voter suppression. And we, we are beginning to understand this whole hulabalo about mail-in ballots. Uh, but um, I suppose the sharper question is, why is it that uh, Trump still has a chance, even with the many blunders? And why, why is it that, um, uh, you know, Biden, who seems to be a front runner right now, cannot, we cannot almost start celebrating his wit you know, as an obvious uh, fait accompli, as it were? Well, first of all, I'll go back to the, I mean, it's, a, it's an important question as one that deserves a, a fuller, more, 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 more nuanced answer. Um, first of all, what we've seen so far is effectively national polling data that says Joe Biden has an eight point margin over Donald Trump. But that's a national poll of registered voters or it's a predicted, it's a, it's an, it's an, it's a, it's an analytical model of uh, the much larger universe of registered or likely voters. But like all polls, they don't measure, they don't register, they don't measure the future, they're not predictive. They measure opinion now within margins of error and correlations of reliable, coefficients of reliability, margin of error of, you know, three, four percent and a coefficient of reliability, uh, 95 percent chance of being within three to five percent. Okay. Um, but the voting, again, doesn't matter nationally as much as it does if you win state by state by state. So in the case of the 2016 election, Donald Trump won Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, three large uh, upper Midwestern and uh, almost Eastern states in the case of Pennsylvania, traditionally democratic for many, many years, um, by a grand total of 78,000 votes among the three states that's about the same number of people who you squeeze into Ellis Park if you put some chairs on the, on the field. That's not a lot of people um, divided up over three large states. And so the Trump calculation at this point is they will win much of the South, the, mid, uh, the, uh, the Midwest, uh, much of the, the Plain states, probably, hopefully, Texas. And then they have to somehow scramble to get a combination of Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Florida. 
because among those four states and maybe one or two others, if they win them by the smallest margins, they will assemble enough electoral votes to just slide over that finish line. So even if they lose the popular vote by even more people than happened in 2016, they will still win because it is a national election, one step removed, if, if you will. Um, Florida is a particularly interesting case because it is so big, there are effectively five different regions of Florida that are very different. Right. Um, I mean, there's, 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 the, there's the black vote in the South. There's the uh, Southern, um, there's the, uh, the, the deep Southern vote in the Northern part of the state, uh, sometimes called redneck Florida, not necessarily very favorably. Um, there is the largely retirees and older people, uh, many Jewish, but not all, uh, in the Carl Gables, Miami, uh, uh, all through Fort Lauderdale, uh, area. Uh, there's the uh, African-American vote, but there is also um, the Latin American Hispanic vote, which is itself bifurcated or trifurcated into a bunch of different divisions. And um, Florida, you, you can't win by simply gaining the support of one or two of those groups. You have to somehow do rather better than that. So it's building a, a national coalition in microcosm in Florida. And it is not clear that the Trump administration or the campaign structure is able to do that. All right. I think we'll have to unmute. There's some background noise there. But My I, alarm I think... has just gone off. Right, right. Yeah, My but... alarm is, I, I got to turn it off just a minute, Bob. Okay. I think as, uh, as Brooks uh, attends to uh, the issue there, I think the, um, the question that we are going to pose to him when he returns is this whole question of what can change uh, between now and um, November. Uh, the polls currently show Joe Biden well ahead of uh, Trump on almost all, all, all scores uh, in, in, in a, a wide range of uh, areas in the US. But uh, one is uh, well, the, the question that will be of interest is, uh, can that suddenly change at some point? I, I think the adage uh, that uh, has been used in political lingua for a long time is, um, is that of uh, a day in politics being uh, too long. We're back. All right, sure. Thanks. I was just filling in for you, actually, and now I'll pose the question, which is, um, uh, and I think this is the final question as we come to, towards the end, uh, which is uh, what will happen between now and November to change the polls as they are now. Now that you mentioned that polls are as of today, or at least for this kind of weeks, this period, the, the couple of hours ahead and, and, and behind us. Uh, but as we go into September, into end of September, into October, and we nudge uh, towards November 3, what, is like, what, what are the scenarios that you can build for a Trump poll, you know, rising or falling, and vice versa for the uh, Joe Biden Kamala Harris ticket. Okay, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, um, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that miraculously a va a working vaccine for the coronavirus can be announced a week, two weeks before the election. That would be a game changer in some ways. Or let's assume that, and I don't, I don't know what it would do, but it will certainly be, it will change the rules on the, on the field rather dramatically. Um, let's assume that the economy picks up suddenly and does really well in the last, couple, last month or so of, uh, of this period. That would be a, a heck of a game changer as well, because with, 10 and a half million people unemployed if they suddenly can, for the most part, get jobs or find jobs or get back their old jobs, that would be quite a game changer. Um, let's assume that um, urban violence breaks out in two or three major cities um, that requires the army 
or the National Guard to contain it, not as a campaign stunt as what happened in Portland was a couple of weeks back, but as a real honest to God problem. That would be a game changer, but not a particularly good one. All right. Because sure. let's take these three in sequence. The vaccine would show that the government can respond and the Trump administration is in fact on the top of its game, even if to, by then 200,000 people have died. The second is you see our economic measures, they're painful, but they help. And the third one is you see law and order is important because those people, now you get to fill in the blank of who those people are, if you wish, uh, those people need to be contained, need to be brought to justice, and the Democrats really don't have the guts for it. All right. Now, the ringer in all this is that mail-in voting in, st in various states is already going to be in progress by the end of September and early October. That means the results will already be baked in before any of those, uh, in any of those uh, occurrences actually happens. What I'm saying in effect is whatever the landscape is now is to some considerable degree what the landscape is going to be as far as voting is concerned. One other uh, point, uh, point four, if you will, the conventions are both now going to be virtual events. There will be no large, you know, 4,000 people in an auditorium cheering and listening to a great speech and carrying on and behaving and all the rest of this. It's all going to be conducted this way, the way we're talking now. And that is such an unpredictable outcome out of, you know, does Joe Biden come across well this way? Does he, uh, and together with his running mate, do they look like the kind of people you want to invite into your house so they can, that they can give you a hug and say, there, there, it's going to be better. We're going to fix it. It's going to be taken care of. Does Donald Trump's arm waving, screaming rant come across as, my gosh, this man needs help? Or does it work the other way? Does it, my goodness, Joe Biden looks tired and sad on television. My goodness, Donald Trump gives me hope because he looks enthusiastic and energetic. Those are the imponderables that right now nobody actually knows. And anybody who tells you they do, um, they're making it up. Right. I think um, uh, that is quite interesting because uh, uh, it speaks uh, speaks to the uniqueness uh, you know, of uh, this year's election on, on all those scores that you mentioned, pandemic, economics, and the nature of the candidates themselves. Uh, and I think now we'll need to start uh, going towards uh, closing, and um, I'm going to invite your closing remarks, but uh, almost directed uh, closing remarks. Usually we say closing remarks, you let the speaker say what they want to say. But uh, I want uh, to, to kind of <laughs> ask that as you do your closing remarks, you focus on, 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 on at least two things. One, help us wrap up. Uh, you started us off with a historical perspective of uh, some key moments in the past that were of a controversial nature. What lessons do we draw for, for, for this election that is equally, as we are saying, uh, unique and challenging and so forth? And, uh, and, and perhaps a related uh, matter is what is the roadmap? What are the key moments as we go ahead uh, towards November in the next uh, you know, days, weeks, and, yeah, days and weeks? Yeah. Sure. Okay. The, the, the lesson, I mean, one of the, I think the most important lesson to be drawn, and I think everything else flows from it, Americans had gotten rather used to um, uh, seeing a machine that runs by itself almost. It wasn't directed from any one particular place, but it all happened. Uh, you know, if you watch birds in the sky and they're flying, you know, 100 birds in a flock, and suddenly they turn, and nobody told them to turn, but they all managed to do it, all without running into each other. It's quite extraordinary to watch. Um, same with fish. They, 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 they swim in a school together, and nobody tells them, you on the left, turn in 30 seconds. I think people got rather blasé about the idea that the election process, not the candidates, not the issues, but the process runs pretty much on autopilot without much need for more than just occasional tweaks and 
and uh, you know temperature checks and make sure it's got enough oil in it and that kind of thing. And in fact, we have learned that the system really is very fragile, very much run by human beings with all their frailties and, and mistakes, and that it is prone to losing momentum or the cylinders burn out or uh, it needs oil replacement or the machinery isn't quite right. And as a result, there are going to be some very strong efforts going forward to reconstruct this somehow. We're going to be enormous bun fights over what constitutes reconstructed. It means who's going to fix it, how, and to what end? Because every time you fix something, uh, it's like all other political behavior. The key, the key question always is, who benefits, right? Who comes yeah. out ahead in the fixing? Uh, this is not neutral stuff. It's, it's always to somebody's benefit. My Latin's no ver not very good, but the, the Latin phrase for that, what, que bono, uh, is, is, is right on point. Who benefits and how does that work? As far as the events moving forward now, this month has both conventions. Uh, the 19th starts with the Democrats and then the Republicans start in the, uh, 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 sorry, uh, 22 or 23 August. Uh, and so both of those happen and we get to judge whether or not this new style of, of convention makes any sense and does it work. And then we get to watch as the campaigns travel effectively digitally from one place to the next to the next. And the thing that you want to watch most of all, because they will start to do this, there are two things. I said the one thing, all right, there are actually two things. Uh, one is the, the information called polls of polls. That is, it's, it's bringing together all the various reliable polling on a given interval over a week or 10 days and seeing the trend lines of the, the polling, who's going up and who's going down not just from the one poll, but from this whole array of polling. But more important still, uh, the polling will start to be given to you by uh, polling in those states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, maybe even Texas this time around, although that seems unlikely, but Texas, perhaps also North Carolina, perhaps even Georgia. Um, and once those temperatures have been read, then you get a real sense of the, of the energy or the heat or the direction of the body politic where it's going. Uh, and that will be public information for the most part. Um, the proprietary polls by the candidates machines will not, but CNN and, and all the others uh, will be very happy to keep posting this material as soon as they have access to it. Um, and then comes four debates, starting in October 7th, I think it is. Uh, three presidential debates, one-on-one, -on -one, Trump, Biden, and one debate, Harris, Pence. Now, historically, the vice presidential debates have been entertaining or interesting or unbearably boring, depending on who was, was in them. The one thing now is, people are going to be judged is Kamala Harris presidential material. Why do I say that? Joe Biden 77. Look at the actuarial tables. What is the average age of mortality for adult males? It's below 77. White House job is a pretty tough business to be in. Um, he's in good health. Uh, there's no reason to assume that he's not going to be in good health for the next couple of uh, months, years perhaps, but we're all mortal. And so we're gonna be watching, I think all of us, is Kamala Harris presidential material? Not so much Mike Pence, because we already have reached a judgment about whether Mike Pence is presidential material or simply uh, the president's yes man. And all right. Then November 3rd, when they count them up, and then the fighting starts over whether or not the mail-in ballots get, get to be counted and which one, when is the cutoff for them. And instead of election day and election morning on the 4th, 
think about this. There is going to be an election week while some states' results may be in doubt for days. And we will go back and forth about this. And the, tele the poor television presenters and anchors, they're going to look really tired. Right, right. All right. I think thanks, thanks Brooks, and um, for your closing remarks. Oh, but as, as you are closing oh. your remarks, Franz oh. has appeared. He's yeah, back. you know what? We're, we're, having, we're having load shedding. Uh, sorry about that. Sorry about that, Francis. Uh, but since you've made it back and we still have a couple of minutes, although I know that um, we are stretching it, maybe we'll just give you like five or so minutes to just uh, weigh in on the point that you are talking about when uh, we were rudely, you know, you know interrupted. Um, and thanks for making it back. Um, I think you are we are discussing why are we even debating the possibility of... Uh, uh, you know, the, the Trump making it. And I think in five yeah. minutes, maybe that will can be your wrap up uh, point, your closing remarks. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the thing is, is that in 2016, we did not uh, think that uh, Trump uh, had a chance of winning. Uh, and, you know, now, given the fact that he is the incumbent, and given the levers that the incumbent has, uh, even though he is uh, trailing quite uh, substantially in the polls, uh, one cannot rule out the fact that he is that that uh, that he's not going to uh, uh, prevail in being reelected. Uh, you know, so the thing is, is that one has to um, uh, not be complacent. Uh, the polls can change, they can tighten, and given uh, all of the, um, uh, you know, things that he's doing to try to um, disrupt the election, uh, it, 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 makes, uh, it makes the outcome unpredictable. Uh, under normal circumstances, based on the way things are going now, one would assume that, that Biden and Harris should win. Uh, and I, I, I think that they still have a good chance of, of winning, but, um, uh, you know, but under the circumstances, we can't rule out uh, Trump's reelection. As, uh, as, as much as we uh, don't want to see that happen. Uh, so I, I, think that's, I think that's why we have to entertain uh, that, that possibility. And then maybe in entertaining the possibility, uh, 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 Democrats and those in, in involved uh, can do whatever can be done to try to uh, make sure that the that the election does come out in some way that uh, that uh, approaches what one calls uh, tends to call free and fair. So that's where we are. All right. Uh, I, I think thanks very much, uh, Francis, and uh, thanks uh, uh, to you, Brooks, too. And obviously, our attendance, we've had a very interesting uh, discussion today. I think my personal takeaway from this is uh, that the U.S. political governance, you know, electioneering system uh, has, been, has served the Americans whether well or bad or, uh, you know, somehow in a mixed way for all these many years. And it appears that it's now due for some form of reform, as both uh, Francis and Brooks put it, uh, the nature of which we are not too sure about. And that these elections have particularly put that whole, uh, you know, the fact that the system is threadbare, uh, it has faced its wear and tear over the years, uh, and that this election has actually put that in very striking focus. Uh, and I think that's an important takeaway from this. We shall continue with the sessions next um, Friday. So we ask you to uh, again join us. Uh, and for now, I think we want to stop here. And once more, thanks uh, everybody. And I think we'll uh, uh, see you again next Friday. Thank you very much.